Here we're going to apply the Huckel molecular orbital theory to a uh, organic molecule butadiene. Uh, butadiene looks like this. We have C double bond C, C double bond C. And if we put in the hydrogens here, we see that uh, each carbon atom is sp2 hybridized, leaving one atomic p orbital left over. These atomic p orbitals are um, parallel and perpendicular to the plane def def um, defined by the sp2 hybridization. Or there's butadiene, and we want to apply Huckel molecular orbital theory to this. Now recall, uh, Huckel molecular orbital theory, your basis set are the atomic carbon p. So we have four orbitals, four atomic orbitals in our basis set. And what we want to do, again, is to uh, minimize uh, the variation of energy with respect to, um, what we want to minimize with respect to the parameter, an expression for energy. And we've done that, and what we get are the secular equations. Since we have now four basis set functions, we're going to get four secular equations. So these are all equal to zero. And we said with the Huckel approximation, a lot of these terms go to zero. And so, in fact, if you make the Huckel approximations, uh, we have lots of zeros here, we have zeros there. And we have along the diagonal, we have H22, H2, uh, H11, and 3, these terms that contain energy. And then along the um, line here that's right above the diagonal, we have terms. And then everything else is zero. Same way below the diagonal, we have terms here right below the diagonal, and then everything else here is zero. And we follow the variation method. We say that the uh, determinant of these coefficients, we want to set that equal to zero, and here it is. So that's that. If we change nomenclature, where H11 is equal to H22 is equal to H33 and so on, we'll have alpha along the diagonal here like this, alpha minus e, that's the energy, and along the off, right all the off diagonals here, we have beta, which we said that was h12 uh, or h21 and so on, and all those are equal, so we just have two parameters in here, alpha and beta, that's the Huckel approximation. And this is a tri-diagonal matrix, for those of you who are interested in, um, or a tri-diagonal determinant from a tri-diagonal uh, matrix. And so what we have now is just to solve for the determinant here and um, figure out uh, what the determinant is and we'll get a polynomial in E. Well, let's make one more approximation. Let's uh, divide this expression here by beta. So everything in the determinant is divided by beta. This then will be 1, and this will be alpha minus e over beta, and we'll call that x. So to clean up the system, this is our tri-diagonal matrix, where x is alpha minus e over beta. So that's a little simpler notation. Same, ma uh, same matrix, same determinant, but a little simpler notation. Now what we want to do is to um, solve this determinant here, or essentially uh, solve for x in this determinant. And I suppose we can uh, channel our uh, maybe high school or college uh, how to determine determinants and so on. But we have in the wings waiting for us to uh, ask it to do something, Wolfram Alpha. So we're going to ask uh, Wolfram Alpha to determine a determinant. So D-E-T-E-R-M-I-N-A-N-T. We can abbreviate that D-E-T. And now what we have to do is put in that matrix. So what you do in Wolfram Alpha is to put in uh, matrix row by row. So let's, let's see. This first row is x100. So we have x100. Zero, zero. We curly Q bracket, put a comma. The next uh, row is 1x10. Curly Q bracket, put in a comma. The next row, again, we're just putting in these rows here. Okay, next row, 0, 1, x, 1, <clears throat> 1, x, 1, curly Q bracket, comma, curly Q, and the last one is 0, 0, um, 1, x. So there's our matrix, and we're asking Wolfram Alpha to determine the determinant. All right, Wolfram Alpha, do it.
Okay, here it is. Uh, this is how it interprets our input here. Looks like that's the matrix uh, or the determinant we want to solve. Yeah, that looks okay. Try diagonal and let's see what it gave us. All right, it gave us x to the fourth minus 3x squared my, uh, plus 1. All right, so there's the determinant x to the fourth my 3x squared plus 1 equals 0. All right, so now we have to solve this. This is a quartic equation, x to the fourth. Turns out that fourth order polynomials, you can get an analytic expression for uh, the roots of this, x equal, and you get four roots. Polynomial, like a quintic, you can't get an analytic expression. You have to solve for the roots numerically. But fourth order, we can do it. All right, so let's try to get the uh, roots of this equation. Uh, well, I've forgotten all my high school algebra, but luckily, hanging in the wings again is Wolfram Alpha. Okay, Wolfram Alpha, let's say solve for x. Let's see, what do we have here? We have uh, x to the fourth <clears throat> minus 3x to the um, x squared uh, plus 1. All right. Let's see if Wolfram Alpha can solve for x here. And lo and behold, it can solve for x. All right, there it is. All right, so here it is. x is plus or minus this, and x is plus or minus that. So you have uh, four roots, as we expected. x, you have two roots for this value of x and two roots to this value of x. So there it is. We solve for x. And I just written down what x is here, and Wolfram Alpha nicely calculates that for us. And so I put down what those numbers are there. All right, so now we have values of x. If we have values of x, we can then solve for energy in terms of these parameters alpha and beta, which are uh, can be parameters you determine from some measurement, or you can estimate those, as we said in the Huckel approximation, as the alpha is the uh, ionization uh, energy of the methyl radical and beta is the stabilization you get when you have parallel p orbitals. All right, but anyway, we're going to get alpha or energy. Now that we have these one, two, three, four values of x, we'll put in one value of x, another value of x, another value of x, another value of x. That will give you four values of energy. Okay, let's do that. Here they are. Uh, so uh, E1, the first energy is alpha plus that, alpha plus that, alpha minus that, alpha minus that. So there we go. We got the energies uh, of butadiene, uh, the four energies. We have four energies because we started with four basis set functions, the four p atomic p orbitals. That will give us four molecular orbitals. Each one of those molecular orbitals will have a separate energy. There they are. Okay. And then let's, uh, let's now solve for the wave functions. Um, so put the energies one by one in the secular equations. Let's say um, we put x1 here, uh, the secular equations, we go up here. <clears throat> uh, we're doing, I guess, these where we've redefined what uh, x is equal to. And uh, what you get is a four equations and four unknowns, because now we put in, in the secular equations, what e is. Okay, so we put in what e is. We know what alpha and beta is, so we can just solve these solve these secular equations here for C1, C2, C3, C4 for that particular energy. Here they are. Uh, here's the four secular equations now with all numbers. We just have to solve for C's, C1, C2, C3, C4. Here they are. So this molecular orbital is 0.372 of the, P1, the atomic P orbital on atom 1 plus point, um, 602 times the atomic p orbital atom 2 and so on. Here's a second molecular orbital where here you're subtracting those two. Here's a third molecular orbital and here's a fourth molecular orbital. So here are the molecular orbitals we got by substituting in each one of those energies. That's kind of cool. And now finally we get the picture of them. Here's the lowest molecular orbital, the lowest energy. That's where we're actually adding all the p orbitals, just adding them together. And so there it is, lowest energy. This is plus, 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 plus. That's where we're just adding all the p orbitals. This is the lowest energy. Okay, that's kind of cool. Now let's look at the second lowest energy. Oh, here, 
Oh, also, let's maybe make it <laughs> say what we're plotting here. Uh, this is actually the wave function, and the different colors represent different signs of the wave function. So here we have a negative and positive. Now I'm going to go to the next highest molecular orbital. We again have the negative and positive, but now we have a nodal plane. Here we had a nodal plane right here in the plane of the butadiene. There's no electron. Uh, the wave function there is zero. There's no electron density there. There's no probability finding an electron in this nodal plane. Here we also have a nodal plane, but we have a second nodal plane that's perpendicular to that. So here the wave function changes sign. It goes from positive to negative. So right there is a nodal plane. We go to the third highest molecular orbital, the picture of that. Here we have uh, the nodal plane and the plane of the butadiene, but also we have one, two uh, areas where they have a nodal plane. And finally, the highest molecular orbital is this, where you have one, two, three nodal planes, in addition to the nodal plane of the butadiene. So the lowest energy, oh yeah, the electrons can just hang out here, peacefully go, you know, hang out in this molecular orbital. However, in the highest energy, oh, I got to go up and down and up and down and up and down. So this, maybe you can associate this with a high energy state and this with a low energy state. Okay, now with those uh, molecular orbitals, uh, now we have to figure out, uh, you know, how many electrons we have to put in and so on. So let's actually do that. All right, so there's the butadiene. We have four energies. We have one, two, three, four. This is E1, E2, E3, and E4. Okay, those are energies. How many electrons can we put in the orbitals corresponding to each one of these energies? Well, two electrons. Remember, the Pauli exclusion principle still holds for molecules and molecular orbitals. And how many electrons do we have? Well, we have one electron in here, one electron in here, one electron in here, one electron in here. So when you remember we sp2 or sp2 hybridized carbon, here's the s and here's the p's of carbon. Carbon is one, two, three, four. Now when you sp2 hybridize, you take this and two of these to form one, two, three hybrid orbitals. This is the sp2, and you put one electron in each hybrid orbital. And then you leave, you're left over with this atomic P, and you put one electron in here. And then bonds are formed in this valence bond picture when this overlaps with something else that has one electron in it. But the point is, for each atomic P orbital you have left over, you have one electron. You have four atomic P orbitals, you have four electrons. One, two, three, four. So there is the um, molecular orbital configuration. So what does that mean in terms of that picture? We have two electrons in this orbital, and we have two electrons in this orbital, and these then are high energy unoccupied molecular orbitals. So when you do spectroscopy, for example, electronic spectroscopy, you can take an electron from this, this orbital and put it up here, so you have a higher energy orbital, and now you have an excited state. Two electrons here, one electron there, and then one electron here. Note that this uh, electron distribution is different. When you take that electron and put it in a higher energy state and adopts this uh, wave function here, this electron is different. Uh, distribution is different from this electron here. So typically when you get electrons going from one orbital to a higher energy uh, state, you have a change in the spatial distribution of electrons.